Uh, we're going to continue this lesson that we've been sharing over the last several weeks on understanding the grace of God. Amen? That um, we have gone through several weeks and even months explaining the difference between the Old Testament and the New Testament. And if you really want to get a clear picture of who God is, you're not going to get it by just reading the Old Testament. Because if you read the Old Testament, uh, you'll get an idea that God is mad, He's angry, He's revengeful, and He'll kill you. <laughs> you take Him off, He'll kill you. Because that's what you see in the Old Testament. You see whether uh, first uh, the, the two brothers, Cain and Abel, the first two uh, recorded uh, siblings on the earth, one killed each other. And go to Sodom and Gomorrah, uh, God uh, killing the prophets of Baal, uh, the children of Israel wiping out armies. And you'll get the impression that, that God is a mad, angry, ticked off God, and you better not tick him off. And if you do tick him off, you better not go around him. Amen? But then you read the New Testament, and all of a sudden, all the killing stops. The last one you see killed, basically, is Jesus. You might read about Stephen being stoned. That's the only person you hear in the whole New Testament that all you hear now is about love, love, forgiveness, do good. And so what I'm going to attempt today is to give you a picture of who really God is. Because if you take the two pictures that you see from the Old Testament and the New Testament, you might might think, well, which one is God? Because, see, whatever as a child of God, whatever you see God to be, that's how you're going to relate to God. Amen? Amen. If you see God as a forgiving God, then you'll relate to Him as a forgiving God. If you see Him as an unforgiving God, you'll, you'll relate to Him as this unforgiving God. If you think that God uh, gets you when you mess up, then when things don't go right in your life, you'll look around and say, well, you know, why did my car break down? Why did my roof leak? Why did my wife leave me? Why did all this stuff, bad things happen to me? I must not be living right. And then on the other hand, if good things are happening to you, you'll take credit, I must be living right. Why? Because that's the way you see God. Well, we're going to talk to you, if I probably won't get it done today, unless you almost stay here two or three hours. Nobody said nothing. Okay, I won't get it done today. <laughs> ah, Matthew 15, look at Matthew chapter 15. I tell you, turn there. I want you to get a clear picture of who God is. Because one of the worst things in the world is to believe a lie. Yeah. And try to make a lie into the truth. And try to make a lie work in your life. It will not work. In Matthew chapter 15, verse 8, we've been talking about getting the heart of God. And getting the heart of God is getting a clear understanding of who God is and how we are to relate to God. Are you there, Matthew 15, 8? Amen. This, uh, he said, this people, Jesus is talking... This people draw nigh unto me with their lips and honor. Uh, these people draw unto, draw nigh unto me with their mouth and honor me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. In other words, their understanding of who I am, they have no clue of who I am. A little side journey here. This whole Bible is only about one person, even though it has several personalities in it. It's only written about one person. And guess who that person is? Jesus. Jesus Christ. Everything in the Old Testament is leading up to Jesus Christ. Everything in the, Old, in the New Testament is pointing back to Jesus Christ. Amen. Soon as Adam and Eve sinned in the Garden of Eden, God made this declaration that it would be the seed of the woman that would destroy Satan. And he said that this seed of the woman, and he's talking about Jesus, that he would bruise his head and his head would bruise his heel. In other words, Satan would be under the feet of Jesus Christ. And everything that happens in the Old Testament is leading up and preparing the way for Jesus Christ. And anyone, any person, any tribe, anyone that got in the way of getting Jesus to the earth, God would move them out of the way. I said God would move them 
out of the way. And you get to the book of Isaiah. Isaiah was written 800 years before Jesus came to the earth. And Isaiah declared, unto us a child will be born. Unto us the son will be given. And the government will be on his shoulder. And to his kingdom there shall be no end. Because all Isaiah was talking about Jesus Christ. Isaiah 53, he said he would be wounded for our transgressions. Bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace would be upon him. The Jews themselves, they were waiting for who? The Christ. In fact, the Jews rejected the Christ that came. And today, Jews are still waiting on who? Christ. Everything that they did was pointing toward Jesus Christ. Amen? And if you don't get that picture in your mind of the Bible and what it's written for and who it's pointed to, you'll get caught up in all these other personalities. Amen? Amen. But the main character of this book, if we were doing a book report, back to my te school teaching days, if I were to ask you what is the main character of the book, if I could, if I, boy, that'd be something if we had a book report we had to read the Bible, wouldn't it? <laughs> Well, I was a skimmer. I wouldn't read no book. Teachers ain't read. Well, I wouldn't read. I read the first chapter and the last chapter and write the book, the book report. <laughs> you all used to do the same thing. Amen. Yeah. You never understand who Jesus was and what the book is all about. Amen. So, if you let, let me give you some more scripture. You don't have to turn there. Proverbs twenty three seven says it's critical the way you think about Jesus Christ. It says, as a man so thinks in his heart, what so is, so is he. Uh, Romans 10.10 10 talks about believing with your heart unto righteousness. That who and how you see life is fixed in your heart. And when we talk about your heart, we're talking about your belief system. How you make your decisions about things. See, when, when you respond to something, it's not because of, it's not the thing that you're responding to. It's already the preconceived idea that you had in your head that you're responding to. For example, if I were to come in here next week and if I had earrings in both ears, I had earrings in my nose, I had earrings in my, in my tongue, where else can you put earrings? Earrings around my lips. And then I came in here and I had on a, 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 a body shirt that would probably be poking out around this section. But, uh, but if my arms were all tatted up, tattooed, your response to me would not be based on how I look. Your response would be based on a preconceived idea that you already had of me. Like, he lost his mind. <laughs> because when you see people like that, you already, you already know when you see people like that, you already decided what you think of them. You just wait for them to show up. Amen? Don't look at me like that. Yeah, there's some people who are, you, you already decided in your heart, when you see a person that looks like that, you've already decided some things about them. And we do that about everything. And it's the same way with God. When certain things happen, we already have a preconceived idea of how you think about it. You look at me, I, you know, till I, I, I'm okay, and then I tell you I'm a preacher. Uh-oh. He a preacher. First thing one up. What do you drive? Like, what you want? You didn't want to know I drive till I told you. What, you didn't want to know what I would drive before I told you I was a preacher. Well, I have some preconceived ideas about preachers and what they drive. Kind of like uh, when I was teaching school, and I was about ready to retire from teaching school, and uh, I was, uh, this was my principal. Uh, no, he wasn't my principal. Uh, this was a guy that, that was my supervisor at the time over me. And, um, and he had this preconceived idea about black preachers that all of them drive Cadillacs. So he said, uh, he said, Julius, you going into ministry? He said, yeah. He said, well, is your church going to buy you one of those Cadillacs? I was like, you you outdated. We drive Mercedes now. <laughs> we'll try and get like we drive Mercedes. <laughs> Amen. Uh -huh, Why? That was a preconceived idea that he already had. And what I want you to do, that if you have a preconceived idea of who you think God is, the goal of this message, I got 30 minutes, the goal of this message is to help reshape because you believe what you believe until somebody challenges what you believe 
You're going to believe what you believe until somebody challenges what you believe. And that's my goal as your pastors when you come in here is challenge what you believe. Uh, simple, you know. You might have been brought up that uh, under the old system that uh, really believed that if somebody does something to you, you're supposed to get them back. Never. Amen? Never. Uh, well, I, I'm not, not you. Not you specifically. <laughs> okay. I'm, 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 let me let me just explain. I'm speaking in generalities here. Okay. I, I'll, 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 yeah. Okay. Okay. All right. Uh, you might uh, believe that if somebody does something, let me just speak for me. That way, uh, that way I will interject you into this. Okay. I was brought up to believe you do something to me, I'm gonna get you back. Say something about my mama. Say something about your mom. I was brought up to believe if anybody hit you, you hit them back. And so in my idea in dealing with people, my preconceived idea is that if you start something with me, you're not going to talk me. You're not going to do it to me. You're not going to walk. I'm not, a, I'm not a doormat. You're not going to walk all over me. And that was my preconceived idea. And believe it or not, a lot of those preconceived ideas came from the Bible. If you go back to the Old Testament, they believed in an eye for it, a two for two. In other words, whatever, when somebody broke the law and did something wrong, that there was a punishment equal to what they did. There was always a punishment. That's one thing about the Ten Commandments, the Ten Commandments, and the whole Old Testament. It was all based on laws and punishment. Exodus chapter 20 God began to, to give the people of, of Israel the Ten Commandments. Exodus chapter 21, verse 1, he said, now these are the judgments. In other words, these are the things that's going to happen if they break these laws. And you go to the book of Exodus and Leviticus and Numbers, you see them passing out all these punishments for everything that they did wrong. I grew up in a house that way. In my house, there was no such thing as forgiveness. It wasn't like... Uh, no, my mother said, you do something wrong, I'm going to get you. Why? She believed that spare the rod. Where'd she get that from? She didn't get that down from the corner lunch. Where'd she get it from? Ran out the Bible. You spare the rod, you spoil the child, and my mother said, now I'm going to get you. I still hear her today. I'm going to get you for all that do. And she would have us take all of our clothes off. And she would take that belt off and she would whoop us naked because she believed that this is the way God had taught her to raise her children. Now, today she'd go to jail. She'd go to jail and I would be calling her. Nah. <laughs> because this woman is whooping me naked. She is down here whooping me butt naked. And my mother, I can hear her today. I don't call her. Call her. Well, I go to jail. That's what my mother would say. And here's what some people believe, even today. I'm talking about getting these. Thinking about what you think about. I hear people today say, I thank God for every whooping that I got. Because if I hadn't got those whoopings, I wouldn't have gone to jail. As if the total accomplishment of you getting those whoopings was to keep you out of the jail. But let me ask you this. Did it keep you from lying? Did it keep you from doing it again? No. It didn't keep me from lying. All the whoopings did for me was taught me how not to get caught. It's all the taught me. Don't get caught, because you know what's going to happen if you get caught. That's what I learned at school. Don't get caught. <laughs> teacher say, teacher say, don't chew gum. Fine, just don't get caught. I'm gonna break the rule. Police say, don't get, don't speed down the street. What's my response? Don't speed. No, don't get caught. Even don't drink and drive. I drunk and drive. Don't do it now. I don't drink now. Okay, so y'all wonder. But back in, don't smoke dope. Don't get caught. Don't have sex with girls. I don't know where that room came from. Don't have sex with girls. Don't get them pregnant. And then you hear stuff like, you don't get pregnant the first time. So I go, oh, okay, I'm saying. See, even today, even right now, some of you are uncomfortable hearing about sex. Because of your preconceived, you don't need to be talking about sex in church. Well, where else should they be talking about it? Right. Amen? Amen? 
all these preconceived ideas that maybe, Jews, if you believe something, that was wrong. And so I have to go back to the Word of God, and I have to examine my belief system, because just maybe, how, I, how you treat your wife. I was brought up in a very male-dominated, dogging women environment. Divorce everywhere. All in our my, my my mother. My mother was divorced twice. All my sisters have been divorced. Most of the people in the neighborhood were divorced. Most of most of the neighbor in my neighborhood, they, they were single, uh, was single female family homes. That was just normal. So my idea of women was treat them any old kind of way you want to, and then when they don't act right, go get another one. And go get another one. And go get another one. Well, how many of you know that you're not going to get along well with somebody that way? Until you change the way that you think. And the Word of God is going to challenge you, even if you call yourself a born-again, spirit-filled, I know the Word of God Christian. There's still some things that you need to know that's going to cause you to grow. Amen. 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 And it's just my job to do it. Amen. Amen. And, and, and sometimes your image of God, I'll say this and we're going to get right back in. Your image of God is one of two things. Number one, you have created a God that makes you comfortable. Mm -hmm. Or you have created a God that has made you uncomfortable because he's challenging you to change. I said this last week, I think last week, a couple of weeks ago, I would love to have a life where I didn't need God. Calm down. I do need him. But I would love to have all the money that I have, all the money that I need. I would love to have a marriage where my wife does everything I want her to do. I would love to have children where my children never, ever misbehave. I would love to have a church where everybody just loved the pastor, <laughs> agreed with everything I said. I would love to have a body that never got sick, that never got old. But since I don't have those things in my life, God help me. Yeah. 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 You understand what I'm saying? God help me, because I don't have that. And I don't believe that God promises those things to you. Yeah. Amen? So I have to go dig into the word of God. And the Bible says that we are to have the mind of Christ. So go to John chapter 14. And Jesus says this. When you get there, say amen. amen. They ask Jesus a question about God. John chapter 14. What? Uh, look at John chapter 14. Look at verse 6. Are you there? Amen. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. So Jesus is saying the only way that you're going to get to God is through who? Jesus. Through Jesus. Okay. If ye had known me, Jesus is, is carrying this conversation on with his, with his disciples. He said, if you had known me, you should have known, the fa known my father also. And from henceforth, you know him and have seen him. Now, he was not talking about, he was not talking about literally seeing God. What he was talking about is that you can know the character of God through me. You can know how God does things through me. Yes. And if you want to know how God operates, look at me. Yes. Amen? Amen? Then he went on and he says, If ye had known me, verse 7, you should have known my father also from henceforth. Ye know him and have known him. Then Philip asked this question. Philip said unto him, Lord, show us the father. As if to say we didn't get it. Show us the father and it suffices or it satisfies me. 
Jesus said unto him, Have I been so long time with you, and yet hast thou not known me, Philip? He that has seen me, he that has understood me, he that has a revelation and an understanding of me, has seen the Father. And how then sayest thou, show us the Father? Jesus was saying, everything that God is, you look at me. Look at me. That's why, yes, I can learn a lot from all these personalities and characters in the Bible. I think, I, I think someone said one time that the Bible mentions over 400 different people by name. But if I want to know God, praise God for Moses and Jeremiah and Ezekiel and Esther and Rachel and Sarah and all these people in the Bible, we can learn from them. But he says, Jesus said, if you want to know who God is, look at me. Yeah. Amen. Look at me. I am the way. Yeah. I am the truth. I am the life. So as Christians, if we want to get an understanding of who God is, who do we look to? Jesus. Okay, turn over to Hebrews. So I love learning. Right. Go over to Hebrews chapter 3. Because if you don't get a, a Bible understanding of God, you'll start making, you know, he's the man upstairs. You ever heard, you know, the man understands, he understands me. And you'll start saying all sorts of things about God that don't represent God. You'll hear people say this. God won't put any more on you than what you can bear. And it's always something bad. God won't let you, God, God will let you, you know, you can say my car broke down, my roof is leaking, the washer and the dryer went out, and my dog is sick. But God won't put any more on you than what you can bear. <laughs> well, who said God did all of that? Come on. Huh? Maybe we need to go back. I mean, maybe after 20 years, the washing and crying going to break down. Yeah. <laughs> huh? Yes. Maybe after 20 years, the roof is going to cave in if you don't do it, anything to it. Yeah. Amen? You got to take your dog to the vet sometimes. Amen? <laughs> See, a lot of things that we blame on God are just human error. Come on. Amen. Amen. Maybe, maybe, maybe they left because they don't like you. Maybe they don't do with God. They just don't like you. Say amen to that. Some of you thinking about leaving. Amen. <laughs> or wondering why they left. They just don't like you. Here's, here's five things I want you to know about God. And again, I, I'm going to develop these. But here's five things I want you to know about God. Because you can look at Jesus and see the same thing. Number one, God is good. Amen. Yes. All the time. There is nothing bad about God. God does not do bad things to people. The book of James, write this down. The book of James chapter 1 says, oh, well, we're in church. I can use my time for whatever I want. Amen. Let's go to James. <laughs> Y'all say, when time's up, Pastor, okay, we're we'll fine. All right. James chapter 1. God is good. James chapter 1, verse 12. Are you there? Yes. We'll come back to Hebrews maybe. Blessed is the man that endureth temptation. You all know what a temptation is. This is not a temptation to do good. This is a temptation to do something bad. Okay? You're tempted to get mad. You're tempted to get angry. You're tempted to get better. Remember, think that things are happening in your life that are just not making you happy. And you're not responding in a positive way. And you're trying to figure out, God, what's going on? Right. You know, people, even preachers say dumb things like when, 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 when bad stuff happened in this country, like 9-11 or the policeman that got shot the other day. Some ignorant preacher will get up and say, God is judging America. You know how stupid that is? Why would God come up? God wants America to get right. Yeah. Why would God have five policemen killed so I could get right? Come on. Does that make any sense? No. See, when you get out your car and come into church, bring your common sense with you. <laughs> you, don't have to leave, you don't have to leave common sense out in the car just because you come into a church. Why would God have five policemen killed 
so that the rest of us could get right. Why would he have those people without the, who somebody, one of those people, or some of those people don't have a father today? Yeah. Don't have a husband. One of those guys just got married two weeks ago. Why would God do that to them so that we could get right? Why would God have two guys get in an airplane and, and, and commit suicide going into a building where I mean 3,000 people? Because he's judging America. Do you know when God judged us? He judged it 2,000 years on the cross. John chapter 12, verse 37. Jesus said, if I be lifted up on the cross, I'll draw all men's sins unto me. Every one of man's sins, amen, that means all man's punishment was taken upon Jesus. St. Corinthians 5 says he became sin for us who knew no sin so that we could live righteously. That's when man was judged 2,000 years on the cross. If God is judging America, he's got to apologize to Jesus. Yes, come on. I'm not judging us. We've already been judged. And you know what was the verdict is? Forgiven, 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 forgiven. Why? Because of Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen. Oh, no. God is judging America. He's not. Amen? All right. Let no man say. Are you there? Yes. Blessed is the man that did for when he is tried, he shall receive the crown of life, which the Lord has promised to them that love him. Let no man say. So what is it saying? Don't say this. Yeah. When he is tempted, I am tempted of God, for God cannot be tempted with what? Evil. With what? Evil. Watch this next part. For God cannot be tempted with evil. What's the rest of that? Neither he tempts anyone with what? So God is not tempting it can't be tempted with evil. In other words, God is not going to do evil. And he's not going to ask anybody else to do evil. Am I reading the scripture right? Yes. He said, let no one ever say, when bad things are happening, don't let anybody say that God is orchestrating this for some grand plan of evil. Yes. Right. Why? Because God is good. Yes. Let me read the rest of this. Where, what, what verse I am? 14. 14. Then when, why? But every man is tempted when he is drawn away of his own what? Uh -huh. That was the evil in that, that was that man's own evil that caused him to get a rifle and go down there and kill those people. That was his own evil. Amen? Amen. And it's our own evil when we go out and do things. You can't be like old Flip Wilson who used to say, what did he say? The devil made me do it. No, no, no. We do what we want to do. Say amen to that. Amen. No, no, we do whatever we want to do and that we can get away with it, we'll do it. The reason why you're here today is because you wanted to come. Yeah. And if you had decided, I don't want to go, guess what? We'll be here. Why? Because God gave us free will and he'll never violate your choice. He will never force you to do anything that you don't want to do. Well, God have a way of getting your attention. Now, when people say that, are they talking about God doing something good to you to get your attention? No. Or, is, or is he going to whoop your backside to get your attention? Because, see, when God wants to get my attention, he blesses me. You, you, you know how God got my attention today? He woke me up this morning. Oh. And I went in, I went uh, inhale, exhale. I said, man, God, you got my attention. Yeah. Yes. You know, God getting your attention is, is looking at Miss Calhoun and seeing what 90 looks like. And I got my attention. Yeah. Amen. Amen. You, you want to see God show out? Let him bless you. Amen. 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 My, my, my son came home the other day and he said, Daddy, got me a new job. And I'm moving out. I said, look at God. Look at it. <laughs> Last one. Moving out. Man, that's how God will bless you. Amen. He'll give me all your children. Amen. <laughs> Bless you. 
Well, he won't put more on you than what? Man, if God, you want to put something on me, go ahead. Because I know it's going to be good, good, good. And I'll try to bear it. I'll try to bear it. But you go ahead. You notice in the Old Testament, in the Ten Commandments, everything was thou shalt not, thou shalt not, thou shalt not, thou shalt not. And if you do, I'm going to get you, I'm going to get you, I'm going to get you, I'm going to get you. But if you go to Matthew chapter 5, 6, and 7, the Beatitudes, first thing Jesus comes out of his mouth is bless, 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 bless. Yeah. Now, you can go after the thou shalt not and I'm going to get you, or you can just go for the bless. <laughs> Sign me up for the bless. Amen. Yes. <laughs> Let no man say, but every man is tempted when he is drawn away of his own lust and enticed. That's when I get in trouble. I say, that's when I get in trouble. It's by my own lust. What is lust? An overwhelming desire to please myself. Then when lust has conceived, it bringeth forth sin, and sin, when it is finished, it bringeth forth death. Let me see if I can. First thing you will need to know about God is God is good. Second thing you need to know about God, God won't hurt you. He won't hurt you physically. He won't hurt you spiritually. There's nothing about God that he wants to hurt you. He didn't cause you to lose your job. He didn't cause you to get a divorce. He didn't cause your children to rebel. Why? Because God won't hurt you. Third thing. God wants to help you succeed in life. Amen. You got to get this picture of God. Because you think that God wants you to, sometimes you got to take, what is it, take two steps forward and do what? Oh, take two steps back. Now, this is, I was a math teacher. This is not good math. <laughs> this is not good math. I used to teach integers, negative numbers. Okay, so we take a negative two, one, two, and a positive one. Two steps back, one step forward. Let's do it again. Negative two. You let me know if I'm getting to my goal. I take two steps back and one step forward. I'm going to take two steps back and one step forward. Now, this is hell back here. This is two steps back and one step. You all see what I'm talking about. And people believe that. That's what life is all about. Well, you'll never get to your goal taking two steps back and one step. That's not even good math. Mm -hmm. Now, understand if you say I take four steps forward and one step back, okay. God is good. God is not out to hurt. If we just think twice about what people say to us. And you say, yeah, brother, that's right, that's right. That's the way, that's the way life is. No, it's not. If that's your perception of life, you will create that kind of life for you. Come on. God is good. I got seven minutes, unless you want me to go longer. God is good. God won't hurt you. God wants 